part, I'm going to stare at my screen to share my screen. Um, beep, beep. Here we go. And there we are. Screen there. Excellent. So yeah, thank you. You know, thank you all for um, having me. You know, thanks to Zoe and Corey for starting this, um, and especially just for bringing all of these vegan sociologists together. Um, today I want to talk to you all about what it is that um, brought so many of us here, our drive as vegans to conduct sociological research on behalf of animal liberation. I stayed up late and then I woke up really early, so I hope that I'm still coherent, um, but I wanted to hear as many papers as possible from the other, uh, the other time zones. And I was particularly struck already by the titles, um, but then once I heard the keynotes, how they're all fitting together. So um, in her keynote for the Australia session, Nick Taylor talked about the need to approach our research from this critical vegan perspective. Then Matthew Cole and Kate Stewart in the London keynote discussed how they develop a vegan methodology in their research on the Donald Watson archives with Iris Crane. And now I'm hoping to tie some of this together um, by presenting an overview of the state of the field in vegan sociology. So I'm looking at vegan studies in sociology with an eye towards what we as vegan sociologists can learn from the research we've already conducted and where we might want to focus our future interventions. Looking at the state of a field is one of the ways that I come up with my new research projects. This is probably the same for you all. Um, you know, a recent state of the field that I did for, uh, you know, what's happening in the study of animals in society. I realized that wildlife was understudied, so that led me to do my most recent book on birding or bird watching. Stepping back from time to time to look at the state and the scope of a field is especially useful in still burgeoning areas of research, which vegan sociology still arguably is in some ways. To be able to ask where we're going, we must first look back at where we have been. I hope this exercise will be useful for you all as well. In the Vegan Studies Project, English literature scholar Laura Wright proposed delineating a field of explicitly vegan studies, a field devoted to understanding the identity and practice of veganism as it appears in popular discourse and media text. Vegan studies, she writes, is focused on what it means to be vegan, a singular identity category that may or may not be linked to an ethical imperative with regard to one's feelings about and advocacy for animals. To be clear, I am not claiming that Wright herself does not care about animals, but in contrast to studying identities that may or may not be related to advocacy, in this talk I want to explore how sociologists study vegan in ways that are related to ethical imperatives that are related to our feelings and that are related to advocacy for animals with the ultimate goal of animal liberation. This is what Corey and Zoe are doing with this organization and with this conference. So I listened to that interview that they did that last week where they were discussing what is vegan sociology. Zoe talked about the epistemological aspect of having a vegan outlook, a vegan perspective on what we consider to be truth and knowledge, and how that informs our research. As Zoe put it, it does matter if you think it's okay to exploit animals when you're conducting your research on human-animal relations. Corey also emphasized including our species identity as an element in research like we do when we consider other aspects about inequality, like race, class, and gender. In her New Zealand keynote that began this conference, Nick Taylor put it this way, this isn't just an intellectual exercise. And in their meta-analysis of sociological animal studies, Nick and Zoe defined emancipatory animal studies as having, quote, its central focus, advocacy for other species. So using their foundational concept, I'm looking at vegan sociology, sociology conducted with these aspects in mind that is also about veganism. So it is a meta vegan sociology, if you will. So what that means is that it's not gonna cover the entirety of you know, all of our studies about animals. I am specifically trying to focus on 
what have we studied about veganism. Um, from time to time, we'll make a brief foray into some of those other areas, but I provide some context. So that's just to say, you know, it's a, it's fairly focused and that's why you know there are a lot of people here today where it's like i didn't cite you but only for that, that specific reason so i'm looking at um existing literature by sociologists specifically who publish their scholarship in academic books and sociology journals or in interdisciplinary venues such as animal studies journals or food studies journals um, and i want to explore this trajectory of emancipatory vegan sociology, looking back at where we've been. So to clarify this, I'm also focusing on empirical contributions of vegan sociology rather than works that are primarily theoretical or conceptual in nature because valid and reliable empirical data highlights a real strength of our discipline. It's something that sets us apart from many other disciplines that study veganism. So normally my talks are just like, photos you know the bird project was great i could just show bird photos the whole time um but for the purposes of this talk since i am you know presenting the sort of a uh, state of the field my slides are just going to be uh, citations um they're not going to be in alphabetical order they're going to be in the order in which i'm uh i'm mentioning them but yeah maybe i should have put in some some birds just for fun ew gotta move on clicked the wrong thing so before we move into that, I do want to make it clear that vegan sociologists have greatly contributed to theoretical and conceptual work on veganism. Nick Taylor and Richard Twine's edited volume presents several theoretical arguments for animal rights and veganism, and Corey Wren's abolitionist theoretical analysis of animal rights advocacy takes a critical lens to a variety of organizations and their tactics. These theoretical works are incredibly important for furthering vegan sociology. I'm just focusing on the empirical works. And I also want to note this is not a formal meta-analysis, um, and I cannot speak to the motivations of each individual researcher, um, but for that I am looking forward to Corey's talk next, um, where she did a, a survey of American sociologists. For these studies, the underlying element behind each of them is that they each help further an emancipatory vegan sociology. Why is that? You know, why does it matter if I don't know this person's, uh, you know, actual motivations? These studies help people, both vegans and non-vegans, understand veganism as a phenomenon, including its connections to animal liberation. In that way, they help vegan and animal advocates better understand how to help people become and stay vegan, and as such, they provide tools for activism. The empirical evidence provided by these studies helps inform the emancipatory efforts of both activists and scholars writing more theoretically based works. We're all in this together. I have also found that relying on empirical research is useful when arguing against non-vegan scholars who are seeking to critique veganism. So a few years ago, I uh, attended an interdisciplinary conference where a philosopher presented a paper critiquing veganism. That was like the central goal of the paper. They argued that veganism was speciesist because vegans, all vegans, do not care about wild animals since all vegans consume copious amounts of earth balance butter made with palm oil. And since palm oil is the cause of deforestation and habitat loss for several species of wild animals, veganism as a whole is bad. After this philosopher's presentation, I asked what evidence they had for their claim, since it seemed to be a pretty bold claim that didn't align with my personal experience nor my academic research. After much back and forth, they eventually said their conclusion or, you know, their evidence um, was based on attending one vegan meetup where the host had a bunch of earth balance in their fridge. I explained that I had conducted in-depth interviews with nearly 100 vegans and vegan animal rights activists, and none of them resembled the stereotype that they presented in their paper. I didn't interview anyone who didn't care about wild animals, and many of the activists that I interviewed specifically discussed boycotting a variety of plant-based products for social justice reasons. Of course, we all know 
Evidence alone cannot convince people of self-serving beliefs, especially when those beliefs are bolstered by the speciesist culture in which we live, but gathering empirical evidence to strengthen our claims certainly helps our cause. So I got that story out of my system. What am I actually going to talk about today? I'm going to start out by explaining how sociological thought evolved to help us arrive at an emancipatory vegan sociology. I'll then discuss how vegan sociologists have contributed to specific areas within sociology, including symbolic interactionist studies, institutions, the sociology of culture, inequality, environmental sociology, and social movements. I end by looking at where we might be going and outlining the myriad paths for future work in emancipatory vegan sociology. There still exist many empirical gaps to fill. So, here are two of our, our precursors to vegan studies and sociology. I'll be talking about uh, Mark C. Pooh, as I like to call him, and then George Herbert Mead, who I think looks like a really nice guy, even if he um, really didn't help the cause for animal studies for a while. To engage in an emancipatory vegan sociology first requires that humans consider non-human animals. This endeavor, in turn, requires decentering humans. This task proved difficult and time-consuming, as sociology began as a wholly anthropocentric field. Early sociologists seeking to establish sociology as a social science endeavored to demonstrate the unique qualities of human interaction and human society. To accomplish this, these early sociologists contrasted human and animal behavior as a way of differentiating between the social sciences and the natural sciences. While animals merely follow instinct, they argued, humans possess agency or free will. Thus, they concluded, we need sociology to study human society. Karl Marx's species being described in Capital exemplifies this approach. He writes, we presuppose labor in a form in which it is an exclusively human characteristic. A spider conducts operations which resemble those of the weaver, and a bee would put many a human architect to shame by the construction of its honeycomb cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect builds the cell in his mind before he constructs it in wax. To Marx, humans are superior to animals because we ponder and plot in our minds before putting a plan into action. Perhaps the best known example of anthropocentrism in sociology comes from George Herbert Mead in his writing on the development of the self. While symbolic interactionists later took up Mead's work to argue that humans and animals engage in shared meaning making, Mead himself argued that animals differ from humans since animals' interactions do not use shared symbols. Mead explained, we do not assume that the dog says to himself, if the animal comes from this direction, he is going to spring at my throat and I will turn in such a way. In contrast, Mead argued that humans use significant symbols that evoke the same meaning for the sender and the receiver. Thus, Mead claimed animals cannot share meanings since they do not use significant symbols. Sociology remained a wholly anthropocentric field until the 1970s when environmental sociologists began to argue that sociologists should study the relationship between the social and the natural world. Moving from what William Catton and Riley Dunlap called the HEP to the NEP, or from the human exemptionalist paradigm to the new ecological paradigm, environmental sociology allows for seeing human society as interconnected with the natural world and as subject to the laws of nature. This move foreshadowed food studies and animal studies in sociology, which in turn opened the, the door for vegan studies in sociology. Although studies of food practices flourished for decades in anthropology, it was not until well after the environmental turn in sociology that food studies began in earnest in our field. These scholars did not yet consider veganism. They only saw vegetarianism as one choice among many. Other early work in sociological food studies considered identity construction via food choices in both vegetarians and vegans and the organizational strategies of vegetarian movement leaders. After this, vegetarianism moved from being considered a fad or simply a dietary choice in food studies to being a topic worthy in and of itself. 
these developments in concert with the evolution of animal studies paved the way for vegan sociology. So around the same time as the environmental turn in sociology, Clifton Bryant encouraged sociologists to study the zoological connection or the relationships between humans and animals. Sociological animal studies began with people's closest connections to animals, their companion animals, and informed the early work of foundational scholars in human animal studies. This shift then led to studies of other categories of animals, including wildlife and farmed animals. Once sociology opened up to studying food and animal issues, and specifically veganism and farmed animals, vegan studies and sociology could emerge. So now, we're at the point where vegan, emancipatory vegan sociology begins. So I want to take a look at how this field is developed, and I'm going to go in the same order as like an introductory sociology textbook goes. So we'll start with interactions, we'll get into institutions, then inequality, then activism. So first we're going to look at symbolic interactionism and yes, yesterday, yeah, I guess yesterday for me, um, a very long day for those of you if you're still here from uh, Australia. Uh, Nick Taylor was saying like, man, human animal studies in the States is so focused on symbolic interactionism and she is right. Um, you know, vegans interactions with non-vegans are some of the most studied aspects of vegan sociology and it also aligns with it being one of the more fraught areas of our lives as vegans. Identity and practice are linked and are expected to be linked with activist identities, especially environmental identities. Those who consider themselves environmentalists perform and are expected to perform environmentally friendly behaviors. The relationship between identity and practice has been well documented with environmental identities and the same holds true for vegan identities. Those who identify as vegan are expected to perform vegan practices in their diet and lifestyle. Most of the sociological works on the link between identity and practice use a symbolic interactionist theoretical perspective. Symbolic interactionists argue that no one identity or object holds any inherent meaning, but instead its meaning is created and recreated in interaction. People can, however, manage the meanings they project through their presentation of self and impression management, seeking to control the image of the, themselves that they present to others. The myriad selves that people perform comprise their multifaceted identity. For vegans, their veganism becomes one part of that identity that they perform for themselves and for others. Becoming a vegan involves taking on a vegan identity which can be so significant that some argue it could be considered a status passage or an important process within a person's life, such as when they move from adolescence to adulthood. Once becoming vegan, vegans then engage in symbolic interactions in their everyday encounters with others, especially non-vegans. Vegans try to present an authentic vegan self through presentational aspects, such as their clothing. Wearing vegan shoes aligns identity and practice and also serves as a preventative measure against non-vegans asking, are your shoes leather? When they're seeking to catch vegans engaging in a non-vegan practice. Because most vegans interactions will be with non-vegans, they prepare for many different types of fraught moments, such as when someone challenges their veganism, ignores basic facts about food production and mammal biology, or when non-vegans ask about veganism at the dinner table. At these times, vegans may engage in face-saving techniques such as avoiding confrontation, waiting until the appropriate time to engage in such a discussion, or promoting the health benefits of veganism as a tactic to avoid at that moment discussing the more controversial topic of animal rights. When engaging with non-vegans close to home, such as partners or housemates, Vegans may also engage in boundary maintenance, such as separating the vegan cookware from non-vegan cookware, winning over friends and family to accept their veganism and to accommodate it, such as by cooking vegan meals for them, and performing veganism in a demonstrative manner, such as sharing delicious vegan food with non-vegans. Vegans' interactions with non-vegans are not always so successful or positive. 
vegans experience stigma or being labeled as odd, different, or deviant. These negative impressions of veganism may come from the news media, which ridicule veganism by stereotyping and by engaging in derogatory discourses, such as characterizing veganism as nothing more than asceticism or a fad, or as difficult and impossible to sustain. These media also alternately describe vegans themselves as overly sensitive or as hostile. With the recent emphasis on clean eating and veganism as a healthy diet, vegans whose bodies do not conform to that stereotype also experience stigma from other vegan activists. Fat vegans report experiencing fat discrimination, including fat shaming, healthism, sizeism, and thin privilege within the vegan movement. In addition to interactions with other activists, this sizeism can come from PETA billboards promoting veganism as weight loss, such as a Save the Whales billboard campaign that reads, Lose the Blubber, Go Vegetarian. Thus, fat activists turn to online activism as a way to avoid the stigma that they experience in offline vegan communities. The various interactions described here are not only informed by non-vegan sensibilities, they're also informed by the institutions that make up our society, which we'll look at now. A significant amount of sociological work facilitates an emancipatory vegan sociology without studying veganism itself. The empirical work of sociologists on institutions that use animals, such as slaughterhouses, cattle ranching, and animal testing, unveil the world of animal uses that vegans critique. As society moved into modernity with its concomitant manners and rules for comportment, slaughterhouses moved out of sight so as to not offend. These centralized industrial slaughterhouses, now hidden from sight, inspired the quote from Paul McCartney, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, everyone would be a vegetarian. Empirical work on slaughterhouses illuminates this now hidden world. Amy Fitzgerald's work has documented the spillover effect from killing animals by showing that communities with slaughterhouses have higher arrest rates for violent crimes than do comparable communities with industrial workplaces like manufacturing. Before the cattle reach the slaughterhouse, researchers have also demonstrated the often contradictory emotional connections ranchers have to their cattle. Ranchers must remind themselves to treat the cattle like economic entities. They accomplish this process by de-individualizing the animals. This process resembles another institution built on animal use, that of animal testing. Researchers who test on animals draw symbolic boundaries between humans and non-human primates and between their own companion animals and the lab animals so that they do not emotionally connect to the animals they use in their test. Policy reform, specifically the 1966 Animal Welfare Act, changed animal use in labs and created stepping stones for future animal advocacy. After the passing of the Animal Welfare Act, using animals in research became more expensive, impractical, and viewed as unethical. The number of regulations on animal use increased, as did the cost per animal. This, in turn, affected whether and how scientists chose to use animals in their research. These institutions structure our everyday lives and their importance is echoed in how meat eating and animal use creates yet another structure in our broader culture. So we'll look at the sociology of culture. Until the cultural turn, sociologists tended to view culture as an enabling force, as an area in which people were free to act agentically. Foundational cultural theorists like Pierre Bourdieu and Anthony Giddens took up Claude Lévi-Strauss's anthropological view of culture as a restricting and empowering structure. As Sharon Hayes put it, culture is both constraining and enabling. Culture is a social structure with an underlying logic of its own. Studies of veganism that focus on food rules and classifications exemplify this classic structuralist argument. Following Levi Strauss's structural anthropology and Mary Douglas's theory of impurity, vegan foods may be seen as pure and non-vegan foods, foods as impure or forbidden. 
Many vegans may view meat and animal products as impure foods to be avoided, but such dietary rules alone are not sufficient to explain vegan practice. Seeing culture as a structure helps sociologists better understand how mainstream views may impede veganism and also how culture might act as an enabling tool for vegan activists. The vegaphobia in the media describes how mainstream culture structures ideas about veganism and provides cultural constraints to veganism. The news media portray veganism as difficult and impossible to maintain, thus creating a cultural barrier to seeing veganism as a possible lifestyle to pursue. But at the same time that it acts as a constraining force, culture can also provide opportunities for vegan activism and identity development. So I've studied how music-based subcultures, such as punk and hardcore, can provide opportunities to learn about veganism and animal rights through the political discourse in the music scene and through providing supportive social networks for vegans. My other work in this area has shown how so social networks more generally provide opportunities for recruitment to veganism and re retention of vegan identity and practice. Through supportive social networks, vegans gain a sense of community support and new cultural tools, such as cooking skills, information on veganism, and other resources to help them live a vegan lifestyle. If culture provides tools to maintain a vegan lifestyle, practice theory further specifies those tools. Following practice theorist Elizabeth Shove, who delineates practices as comprised of competencies, materials, and meanings, Richard Twine showed how a practice theory approach helps explain how vegans learn how to be vegan, how they understand what veganism means, and how to learn how to use new materials, such as new vegan food items. These new competencies about meanings and materials help people successfully become and stay vegan. Cultural sociology can also explain why vegans may engage in the face-saving strategies described earlier. While vegans may believe that veganism is a collective moral imperative, they strategically deploy individualized explanations for veganism, presenting their morals as an individual choice or experience. Individualism is a readily available discourse or tool in the United States, and thus it can easily be deployed to diplomatically discuss veganism with non-vegans. So as I've discussed here, this broader culture can contribute to negative stereotypes about vegans. Vegan identity does not exist in a vacuum, however. It also intersects with other important aspects of a person's identity, such as gender and race. So now let's look at sociological studies on veganism that relate to inequality. Research on inequality, most often in terms of race, class, and gender, is a core foundation of sociology. In addition, obviously, to the standalone courses on each subject, the study of inequality remains central to sociology courses, graduate training in sociology, and scholars studying race, class, and gender comprise some of the largest sections of the American Sociological Association. However, within empirical sociological vegan studies, this remains an understudied area. This may be due to the significant theoretical work already done in the area. See, for example, these works from Richard Twine, Jessica Greenbaum, and David Nybert. While most surveys or surveys show that most vegans are women, empirical sociological research on gender has focused on men and masculinity. This may be due to the demographic and cultural minority status of men in a culture that equates meat with masculinity and virility. To wit, empirical research on vegan men has reiterated the importance of those dominant cultural discourses about gendered food norms to vegan men, such as their need to engage with the importance of meat as a cultural foundation of masculinity, sexuality, and strength. Other research has shown that vegan men challenge this narrow definition of hegemonic masculinity, instead redefining their compassion for other animals as an act of courage and holding up vegan athletes as examples of strength. Thus, while legitimating veganism as a masculine endeavor, these vegan men fall short of challenging gender inequalities. 
Similarly, boop, it's the last one. Similarly, while studies show that most vegans are white, empirical research on race is focused on vegans of color. Jessica Greenbaum found that vegans of color reported they had to navigate race in relation to their veganism in a variety of ways. Vegans of color had to confront the stereotype of veganism as a white, economically privileged practice. Simply by virtue of their veganism, they were accused of acting white. They also had to fight the notion that veganism was incompatible with their ethnic food identity. Vegans of color pushed back against these negative stereotypes and assumptions by focusing on simple, affordable, plant-based foods that aligned with their ethnic cuisines. These acts, seeking to normalize and universalize veganism, play a role in more than simply facilitating one's own personal practice of veganism. They also contribute to veganism as a social movement. So now we're going to move into what, when I teach introduction to sociology, I call the appetizer platter of sociology. Once you get the foundations and you get inequality, then we just cover, you know, a bunch of different topics. Um, for the purposes of this talk, and as you will see in the conclusion, this really just covers two main areas um, in our you know, vegan appetizer platter. We're going to look at environmental sociology and social movements. As the fields of environmental sociology and animal studies and sociology intermingle, their work increasingly becomes relevant to vegan sociologists. Many of the studies I reviewed earlier could fall under the rubric of an environmental sociology. It's like a cousin to vegan sociology rather than a field or a different field, but here I'm trying to highlight some of these recent studies that exemplify how vegan sociologists can intervene in this particular subfield. Environmental sociologists who study environmental issues related to meat consumption further add to our understanding of a variety of issues related to veganism. Thus, no matter the motivation, these works likewise provide empirical evidence to further vegan sociologist work towards animal liberation. A cross-national comparison of meat and fish consumption found that economic development spurs on the expansion of consumption rates. Geography and culture both played a role, where Asian regions consumed more fish as their economic development grew, and non-Asian regions consumed more meat as their economic development grew. Other environmental sociologists have studied what factors influence support for policies that promote plant-based diets. Comparing four different policies aimed at reducing meat consumption, so environmental, animal welfare, public health, and direct meat reduction, they found that different factors affected support for each policy differently. That is, it matters how these policies are presented or framed to the audience. These works provide an understanding of what factors influence meat consumption and how to promote veganism. So now, this is the topic I always say for last in my class, um, but it is one of the largest topics for vegan sociology, social movements. So we'll look at how sociological research on veganism contributes to the study of social movements and vice versa. Sociologists have long studied the animal rights movement, even though some of that research may not have been conducted with animal liberation or emancipatory vegan ethics in mind as a goal or a motivator of the research. Early research on the animal rights movement explored the importance of emotions in activism, how activists purposefully use shocking images to get people to oppose practices like animal testing. Other research on tactics has found that gender plays a role in the reception of tactics, such as when men dismiss women activists as being overly emotional. Since those earlier studies, more recently scholars have studied the vegan and animal rights movements in which they participate, and with this emancipatory focus, they seek to promote and aid those movements with their work. More recent sociological research has continued studying tactics through a gender and race lens and has studied direct action tactics. A prominent strand of research on veganism focuses on lifestyle movements. Hanfler and his colleagues define lifestyle movements as focusing on cultural goals and tactics used by activists 
centering on people's everyday lifestyle and consumption choices. In lifestyle movements, the goals and the means of the movement are purposefully interchangeable. Through their actions, lifestyle activists create, in the moment, the world they wish to see in the future. Lifestyle movement activists make changes in their identities, lifestyles, consumption practices, and ways of speaking about the world. By encouraging individual, private, ongoing actions, which participants see as part of their personal identity, lifestyle activists see their work as moving towards larger social changes. Hanfler and his colleagues used veganism as an example of a lifestyle movement alongside green living, straight edge, and voluntary simplicity. It's easy to see why veganism exemplifies a lifestyle movement. Culture structures food norms so that people consider it normal to consume animals and to use animal products and use animals for other purposes like clothing, testing, or entertainment. Veganism as a lifestyle movement aims to end such uses of animals through prefiguration or making the changes that vegans wish to see in the world in the here and now. These vegan movements are international. Interviews with vegan activists in France demonstrate the importance of prefiguration in everyday life in vegan activism, such as sharing food at pop-up events like Vegan Place. Seeing these alternative spaces in public facilitates vegans being the change they wish to see. Further, in countries that still view veganism as a weird and unhealthy diet, such public displays of veganism demonstrate the possibility of an alternative vegan lifestyle to non-vegans. Just as culture provides tools for vegans, Vegan food itself provided a tool for animal rights activists when promoting veganism. The utility of vegan food as a tool depends upon how readily available it is. In my work on animal rights activism in France and the United States, I found that animal rights activists in the U.S. easily used vegan food as a cultural resource in their work, bringing store-bought foods to events to showcase the ease of eating vegan. Animal rights activists in France, in contrast, had a more difficult time using food as a cultural resource due to the lack of vegan food options. Instead, French activists focused on promoting homemade vegan versions of traditional vegan foods and emphasizing the conviviality of communal vegan meals. When studying the animal rights movement in Italy, Niccolò Bertuzzi demonstrated the importance of veganism to animal advocates not as a purity test for activists, but as an abolitionist practice. He divided the movement into three areas, animal care, which included companion animal rescues, protectionism, which included national NGOs focused on lobbying, and anti-speciesism, which referred to the grassroots organizations engaged in radical activism. He found that anti-speciesist activists were much more likely to be vegan than were animal care or protection activists. He also found that veganism was much more of a practice among left-wing activists, followed by centrists, and with the smallest number of vegans among right-wing activists, a finding similar to Corey Wren's post-2016 election survey of U.S. vegans and their political beliefs. Her findings on the relationship between veganism and progressive politics concur with other demographic studies of vegans conducted by nonprofit research institutes for animal advocacy organizations. So that's where we've been. Fieldwide trends such as the development of environmental sociology, the sociology of food, and the sociology of animals and society paved the way for an emancipatory vegan sociology. These movements allowed sociology to break from its anthropocentric foundations and consider non-human animals in their work, which in turn allowed for emancipatory vegan studies to thrive in the field of sociology. Our empirical work is a strength that sociology brings to the larger interdisciplinary field of vegan studies as a whole. While each disciplinary field has contributed to the broader theoretical work in vegan studies, Sociology and other social sciences help further understandings of the contemporary social world and activism for animals through our methods of collecting empirical data. 
This empirical work is crucial for shaping activist strategies and public policy seeking to create a vegan world. But we have a serious challenge to meet. In their meta-analysis of sociological animal studies, Nick and Zoe found that articles based on empirical data were significantly more likely to be depoliticized than were theoretical papers. Thus, while our ability to gather empirical evidence to make our claims can be a strength, we need to rise to the challenge of infusing our empirical work with the critical focus of an emancipatory vegan sociology to do work on behalf of other animals and towards animal liberation. So where are we going? Where might there be the most room to grow? Right now, vegan sociology has its strongest empirical foothold in studies of symbolic interaction, the sociology of culture, and social movements. Some of these important areas, like inequality, need much more empirical research to bolster the existing studies on gender and race and to bring in other areas of investigation. We also have plenty of room to grow in other areas central to sociology, such as socialization, deviance, religion, work, medical sociology, education, and the family. When I first started interviewing animal rights activists, many of them said, why are you interviewing me? You should be studying the meat eaters. Like, this is what we need to know about. So this is another area, especially related to soci socialization. And with the research from Faunalytics showing that most vegetarians and vegans eventually return to meat eating, this is it's another critical area to investigate. Rather than being seen by other sociologists as primarily or even exclusively being part of an animal sociology, we should infiltrate some of these other subfields to bring our critical perspective to them. The papers from this conference show that vegan sociologists are already conducting research in some of these un understudied areas, and I hope that this review of the field has given folks some ideas of where you might want to go next. Our work is vibrant, expanding, and necessary, and I appreciate sharing this space with you all doing such important work for the animals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was a very informative. I, I couldn't keep up. I was jotting down articles and things that um, I have, I've missed and I need to, to look at. So I bet you a lot of people are hoping you make this accessible so they can um, do what you've done and gone through the history and, and, um, and the flow and where we are today in such a clear way. It was very, very, very clear and very organized and very informative. So I appreciate that. No, thank you. And I'll admit, I turned off the chat because I didn't want to be distracted by it. And I had a moment in the middle where it was like, it's dinging every time. And I'm like, are they telling me that I'm muted? Is something going on? So, <laughs> so I'll turn back on the chat. So, yeah, no we had worries. a few questions come in as you were doing it. But it, yeah, it was very, very clear from our end anyway. Wonderful. Cool. Thank you. So one of the questions I can just jump in. One of the questions um, actually came from Corey. Um, she remembers meeting you back in 2013, we think it was. Um, and just kind of speaking, it was a really humbling moment. And I remember meeting you in New York at ASA. And again, that was a very humbling moment for me too, just kind of recognizing that you are a founding figure. Um, and so Corey's question is, have you considered what it means to be a founding figure in vegan soci sociology and if it's something you're conscious of? No, so honestly, when she said that at the end of the last session, it was, I'm having like a, an identity moment. Like, what is this? Um, you know, I feel like we're kind of all founding this area. And this is absolutely no disrespect meant to the people who have, you know, like Nick Taylor yesterday was saying, I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, there are definitely people who have been studying um, you know, animal issues for a really long time. And she, you know, she said that as her career developed, she was able to get into, uh, you know, more critical areas. Um, but that did have me thinking over the break, like, founding? What? I don't, but I do remember when I got into this area, um, I was an undergrad in sociology and I had gone vegan um, in 1998. I was actually studying abroad in France it's all fitting together now. Everyone's like, oh, I see. This 
to just studying your biographical trajectory. Um, but I, I had gone to study abroad in France. I was hanging out with vegan punks and hardcore kids. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to go vegan. So I was taking sociology courses at this French university, and I did my first, um, you know, that was sort of my first foray into like, I'm going to study vegetarianism and veganism. And the professor there said, this is not sociology. This is a polemic. This is just activism. And I'm like, I don't understand. She was also really mean in a whole different way. And that was actually a medical sociology class. And maybe there's a reason why I never got really into medical sociology. But all this is to say, when I came back for my senior year um, as an undergrad, this was like, you know, the, the late 90s and sociology of food was really taking off. And I told my, you know, major professor, like, I want to study veganism. And thank goodness I had a supportive undergraduate professor um, who really facilitated that. And, you know, that then led me to do my, um, you know, master's thesis on veganism, which I guess that became then my first, um, you know, veganism as a cultural movement. So, um, yeah, I think. I think that I didn't really answer that question, or maybe the answer is, I don't really think of myself <laughs> in that way, um, because it's the beautiful part about going to, you know, the Animals and Society Institute conferences, or the Animals and Society section of the American Sociological Asso Association, or this conference is, these are our buds, like, this is our people. So we're all just trying to, um, you know, help each other further this area of study. Um, and part of what I love about it is that there is, you know, I also do like sociology of culture and social movements. Um, social movements is pretty chill. But within the sociology of culture and the, um, you know, the American Sociological Association, there's a lot of um, posturing and a lot of like i'm a very important person like one time i went up to someone and said hey i really enjoyed your talk and he said you should have so <laughs> um, yeah i think that uh you know corey and zoe are, are founding this organization you know everyone is is contributing to moving it forward so sorry, that was a long, like, biographical reminiscence, but it was spurred on by what Corey said at the last, uh, the end of the last talk. Um, and that's actually, no, it's great, because I think that actually might have addressed Maria's question as well, because she was wondering about tips on how to survive in such a, well, harsh mm -hmm. climate, sometimes academic and social, um, and how to stand your ground within places that don't take vegan sociology seriously. And I would kind of suggest that it's about finding like-minded folks to kind of support and, and give us energy to move forward in this work. Exactly. And find, you know, find mentors who are more advanced than you in the field, you know, find people that you can ask, hey, this thing happened, you know, or I'm encountering this challenge. How did you handle it? And then when you get to the point where you are able to act as a mentor, you know, return that favor to people. Um, you know, I found the animal studies and vegan sociology folks to be among the kindest in that regard. Um, you know, it's, I would say just don't hesitate to reach out to anyone. Um, yeah, I think we all just want this field to succeed. Um, and I guess the last question um, was from Lordana. She wanted you to, to elaborate a bit on the point about articles that use empirical data um, being depoliticized. And, uh. Right, so that was actually, now I'm looking at Zoe. Um, that was actually me quoting Zoe and Nick Taylor's article. That was that meta-analysis. So they had done a meta, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit and then I'll be like, Zoe, please unmute. <laughs> <laughs> But they had done a meta-analysis of um, all of the sociological studies on animals and society since, I think, 1979. And they had, so, okay, I so see you're nodding. <laughs> and they had specific criteria for um, this is how we're going to code uh, this or that element. So is this a primarily theoretical or conceptual paper? Is this primarily a, um, 
an empirical paper or is it a theoretical paper informed by empirical work? And that finding just floored me that, you know, the theoretical works were so much more critical. Um, I, don't have, I don't have the article up. I thought for a second about like, let me go find it, but then you'd just be watching me click on my computer. Um, but yeah, it was something like, you know, 75% to 25% or some, you know, like astonishing difference. Um, and, you know, I wonder if some of that is related to what, you know, Nick was saying in her talk yesterday um, about how, you know, we also have, uh, you know, we are doing work for the animals, but we are also trying to, you know, keep our jobs. And, you know, uh, she was talking about like, publish, you know, publishing your papers and journals that your you know, school will accept for tenure and promotion, or if you're going on the job market, you know, we, we have a lot of um, constraints on our work. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know if Zoe you have a if you had a conclusion as to why that was. I'm just piecing that together with what Nick was saying yesterday. Or if I missed the conclusion, I was so struck by the finding. I don't want to cut into your question time too much. Um, and it was so many years ago. But I think some of the things that fed into it were really around part of it was like the positivism in sociology. And for a long time I think it was very difficult to publish things that would be taken seriously if you were seen to take a standpoint. A standpoint, And also just, I think there is still that reluctance. You know, Rita Wilkie talks about dirty scholarship and um, the idea that when you do take a claim that is explicitly for animals, it's seen as kind of lesser scholarship in some way or that you're not being very analytical. And I think that filters into the way that people write their articles. Yeah. I don't know if that's concluding enough. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I think that um, we wanted to wrap up so we have a few minutes um, before the next session. I believe that there are a couple of questions that are coming in. What I can do is I can email those to you, Elizabeth, um, and then you can respond to the, the folks um, if that's okay. Does that work? Perfect, all right. Um, so, <clears throat> That is it for our keynote session. Thank you very much to Liz. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, the other thing that came out of the chat, there were multiple requests. If you could share your PowerPoint, would you be comfortable with sharing the PowerPoint presentation? All right, so yeah. So if you wanted to send that to either, I guess me, me Corey or Zoe, um, and we can forward that around to our attendees, that would be wonderful. Yeah, totally, yes. And also I actually should add, um, you know, part of this, when Corey asked me, you know, hey, do you want to do this? It was like, oh, what am I going to do? Because I'm kind of in between a number of projects right now. Like I just had three huge projects drop in my lap. One continuing with birds, one about child environmental activists, and one about veganism. And I'm having to kind of triage them. In the meantime, um, Laura Wright had actually asked me to write a chapter on, you know, vegan sociology or vegan studies in sociology. So that's what spurred me to think about like, well, where are we? Um, so I obviously changed stuff and added stuff around because this isn't, uh, this is actually pretty different um, than what's going to be there. Because for that one, the point is, you know, telling non or non sociologist what we do. And this one is an internal audience like, hey, let's look at this in a more critical eye. And I brought in a lot more stuff. Anyway, the point is some of this <laughs> will be in um, the forthcoming Handbook of Vegan Studies, where I know um, Corey has a chapter as well, and probably some other folks. Um, but yeah, this has a lot more stuff. So I'm totally happy to share that PowerPoint. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I think we are going to wrap this session. Um, please stay tuned for our next session. Let me just pull up my schedule.